So we're coming to the final week of a series that's been a bit longer than our normal series. Uh, and there's a few reasons for that. First of all, it's an expression of our vision as a church. Uh, we have some big ideas and some big plans for the future. But actually, um, our main vision, our core vision, is that you and I will live with the abundant life of God. Jesus said, I've come that you might have what? Life. And life in all its fullness. And a lot of people go through life today just trying to work out how they survive. And actually, God has come to bring us life that will not just survive, but will thrive. So it's a vision, key vision of the church. And so that's one reason why we're taking um, more time than normal. And the other reason is that there are seven signs of life in, uh, in everything in creation. And we've been unpacking what these seven signs mean to our spiritual life. So we've been applying them. Everything lives, feeds, moves, grows, breathes, reproduces, disposes, and has sense. And we've been unpacking these seven and taking one a week. And we're at the final one today. And we're going to look at our senses. What do you mean by senses? It's a little bit feely, touchy, isn't it, to um, finish off our series. But we're going to look at how our senses um, often determine very much as gateways into our heart and our minds and our lives in terms of determining whether we live with a life or whether we see things from a different perspective. So sense, to see what God sees, hear what he says, taste who he is and radiate the goodness of God to the world around us. So would you turn with me to Romans chapter 8 verses 5 to 17. Uh, you haven't got a Bible, that's no problem. The words will appear on the screen behind us so we can look at this together. And it says this, Romans 8 verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the spirit, but, but if you by the spirit will put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit and we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. There is so much in this chapter that we could do a 20-part series on this and still not exhaust all that's in here. But I want to pick out the, the point where it says the mind should be set on what the Spirit desires. And I wonder how your mind is set. I wonder what the presupposition of your mind is. Are you constantly programmed in your mind to be thinking what is the Spirit desiring? Or are there obsessions in your life and in your experience in this world that causes you to be thinking constantly in your mind about the things of this earth. See, our mind is influenced by our senses. So our mind, our, our eyes, what we see becomes a doorway. What we hear becomes a doorway. What we taste uh, becomes a doorway. What we touch becomes a doorway. And what we smell becomes a doorway. You know, for example, if you go into a supermarket and you had no intention of buying bread, and that smell of fresh bread wafts through the aisles, it can change your mind, can't it? You know, it's very persuasive. 
And all of these areas, these gateways, these doorways into our life produce places of influence into our mind and they can get us thinking one way or another. And we're surrounded by images, surrounded by voices, surrounded by smells, surrounded by experiences and surrounded by just the aromas of this world that want to get our minds to be set on the things of this world. But I don't believe God wants us to be that people. I don't believe Sunday should be a rescue shop for people who live six days a week, absence of God, and they come just to put it right before they start the next six days of being absent from God again. I don't believe that's what church is about. I don't believe that's why I'm here. I don't believe that's why you're here. I believe you're here because God wants you to live a thriving, abundant life full of the things of God. And He wants you to be people whose minds are set on the things above, who the Spirit of God is our driving force, that the aroma of Him is always in our nostrils, and it gets us thinking on the things above. Our eyes are not just seeing what this world throws at us, what the advertising agencies throw at us, but our eyes are seeing something that's beyond the realms of the natural into the realms of the supernatural, and it gets our minds to be set on the things above. Our hearing is not just set on what people gossip, on what people say, on what the media projects to us that we should be listening to because if it is our our minds will be set on the things of this earth but our ears should be sensitive to the voice of God and hear what he's saying so our minds can be set on the things above and a church that's alive a church that's full of the abundant life of God is a church whose mind is set on the things of the spirit it's not about the programs that we run It's not about the music that we sing. It's about a people whose minds are prepared and trained in the ways of God. That's what the church of Jesus Christ should be. Amen. (laughs) And anything short of it, to be quite honest, is playing games. Anything that falls below that standard is to form a sort of Christianity that was not the one that God designed. So let's look at these doorways, these gateways into our mind, so that we can see how our senses can be set on the things above, so that our lives can be full and propelled into the purpose and the life and the destiny of God. Let's look at our vision our sight, what we see. Let's look at John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 19. It says this. Jesus gave this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by Himself. He can only do what He sees His Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Who was saying this? It was Jesus. Jesus who came to this earth from the Godhead. It's been outside of time since the very beginning, um, coexisting, co-equal with God. And he's saying, I don't do anything that I don't see the Father doing first. If that pattern is good enough for Jesus, or more than that, necessary for Jesus, how much more is that pattern for us? I only do what the Father is doing, what I see the Father is doing. I wonder when the last time you faced your circumstance of your day and asked the question, God, what are you doing here? What are you up to? I wonder when was the last time that you saw a chaotic situation or you experience some difficulty or some trauma, and you ask the question, God, what are you doing? Because we are so easily taken up with the environment that we perceive with our natural eyes, that we often fail to ask, God, what are you doing? But I promise you, I guarantee you, I assure you, from the Word of God, that Father God is constantly at work in your life, constantly at work in your environment. He's constantly at work in this city. He's constantly at work in the nations of the world. In a few weeks' time, we'll have our 
New Year's Eve um, celebrations right across the face of the globe. And there will be, I'm sure, TV chat shows and news programs that will be reviewing the year that has just been. And many of them will express surprise at what this year has turned out because it's defied many predictions in the world of politics, in the world of finance. There have been so many unexpected things that have happened this year. There seems to be a whole spate of celebrities who have died this year and people seem to have gone from one news story to the next of things that have gone wrong or things that are different to how they anticipated. But I promise you, God has been at work this year. I promise you that he is the Lord of the nations. And when did we ask last, what is he doing? What are you doing, God? Because that changes our perspective. When we begin to see things differently, it begins to change our perspective. So in your life, why don't you frame the question regularly? Whatever you're going through, just stop, pause and say, God, what are you doing here? See, often we're so obsessed with the natural, we're so obsessed with the things of this world, that when we fall into a pit and we're in that pit, our prayer is usually, God, will you get me out of this pit? But sometimes God is in the pit with you and he wants you to pray, God, what do you want me to get out of this pit? Because there's some things that God is doing in you and through you that's, that's powerful and deep and we can miss it unless we ask him. See, what you see determines where you head towards. So there's a level of God's people, his church, that we set our minds on the things of God by seeing what God is doing and what he's up to. But there's another level of this seeing. It's not just seeing what God is up to, but it's seeing what God is going to do. So there's a prophetic mantle on the church, a prophetic mantle on the people of God, that we're meant to have the sight that goes beyond the current situation. Because God lives outside of time. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. He knows what tomorrow is going to bring. There's not a moment when something happens and God thinks, I didn't see that coming. There's been no surprises to God this year. Brexit wasn't a surprise to God. Trump wasn't a surprise to God. Nothing is a surprise to God. He sees it all. He understands it all. And he knows where it's all heading. And the people of God should be able to access the mind of God in order to understand the purposes of God that are yet to happen. You know, part of those are the promises that God gives in his word. There are promises in here that are to be fulfilled in our lives and we only really step into those things when we see the promises and we begin to claim them in our lives and say, God, I respectfully remind you that you have promised to do this, O God. Lord, I respectfully remind you that you have positioned a promise and you say you're a God who never lies. You say you're a God whose word never returns void. Father, you have spoken it and yet I'm not yet seen it in my circumstances. God, I call before you and I pray, God, that promise into being in the name of Jesus. And some of you need to get militant on that stuff, but I tell you, you'll only do that when you see it. You won't unless you see it. We roll over and give up so easy. It's because we haven't got our sight sorted. Too busy looking at the things of this world. God wants us to see what he's doing and what he's up to. You know, I pray the posture of us as a community here in this city, here in this county of Devon, maybe even in this nation and the nations of the world, that we will constantly have our heart inclined to say, God, what is it you're up to? What is it you're doing? I, I've seen with my spirit's eye. I've, I've seen... I've seen this city on their knees before God. Do you know when I pray about that, I don't think that's just positive thinking. I don't think that's just the wishful thinking of a pastor who's had too much cheese the night before or has been in, a, been in an enthusiastic worship set and then suddenly feels a little bit more upbeat. I tell you where that comes from. It comes from a promise in God's word, a description of his heartbeat that says it is not his will that any should perish. God's word says that. 
So when I come before God and I say, God, I respectfully remind you that you've said not one person is desired by you to perish and miss your life and miss your purpose. God, this city of 120,000 people, Father, I claim every single one of them for you. When I pray that, I know I'm praying in line with God's will. I'm not contradicting him. I'm not trying to persuade him. It's what he wants. But you see, when I see it, and then I join together in agreement with the Spirit, there's something powerful happens. Claim the promises. Get stuck into God's Word. Get the promises of God's Word over your life. And claim them. Step into them. Inherit them in Jesus' name. You know, some of them are like, and I've often said this about prophetic words, they're they're like the automatic doors at a hotel entrance. They only open as you approach them. When you see them, you walk toward them. And when you walk toward them, you claim them. And when you claim them, you see them. So many stand back and say, well, the doors are closed to me. You need to walk toward them. That's when they open. But unless you see them, you don't do that. So our sight is important. So be a community, be a person, be a follower of Jesus that sees what the Father is doing, understands what the Father wants to do. What about your family? How many, don't put your hands up, but I wonder how many here have got family members that are away from God. Some have gone away, some have never come. And I don't know if you've given up on praying for them. I don't know whether you feel like your prayers have just gone on so long. If God was into it, he would have done it by now. I don't know what your posture of your heart is and what your position is, but I tell you, if you get before God, I believe you'd see in his heart his desire for your family. And you'll see that his desire for your family is greater than your desire for your family. And you'll be able to call upon him and begin to position your heart. Say, God, I'm going to claim your promise here that it's not your will that my family doesn't know you. I'm going to step into this. I'm going to claim this. It all begins with you seeing it. But thirdly, one of the greatest things we can see, Hebrews 12, 2, says this. Fixing our eyes on Jesus pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixed on Jesus. And there'll be all sorts of things that will try and grab your attention. And you have to say, no, no, no. I'm fixing my eyes on Jesus. Something calls for your attention. No, 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 I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. There's a purity that comes from fixing our eyes on Jesus. There are many things that call the attention of your eyes, but no, I'm fixed, fixed, fixed on Jesus. So your eyesight, your vision, seeing what God's up to, what he's going to do, and seeing Jesus. What about our hearing? Well, John 10, 27 says this. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. There's a difference between hearing and and listening. Some of you right now are experiencing that. As you stare at me with blank faces, you're hearing, but you're not listening. All those who didn't laugh then are the ones that applies to. Sometimes I get a call from Nita. Said, um, you know, when you come home from work tonight, will you pick something up at the shop? I'm just finishing off a conversation with someone else. And I'm, yeah, 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 do that. No, no problem. See you later. And then I'll remember to go to the supermarket. And I'll stand at the entrance and think, what was it she asked for? I, I remember that there was a task, but I just don't remember the detail because I was hearing, but I wasn't listening. My sheep listen to my voice. We hear a lot, but do we listen a lot? My sheep listen to my voice. See, listening to the voice of God requires tuning in. I used to, uh, when I worked at our Bible college, I'd often take our students off-site, 
sometimes into the middle of a city or sometimes into the middle of a countryside. And I'd say, all right, I want you to get a notepad and pen and I want you just to stand there, find a space where your other fellow students are not with you, stand alone, stand in silence and write down everything you can hear. Close your eyes if you want to, but write down everything you can hear. And it was fascinating because there were some obvious things that they would say. So right now, if you were to do this exercise, you can say, I can hear Pastor Mark talking. But if I ask you to listen a bit deeper than that, you might hear someone unwrapping that sweet wrapper behind you. Um, if I ask you to listen deeper than that, you might hear the sound of the heating system, constant buzz in the background, or you might hear the sound of the lights humming. You might hear the projector fans whirring. You might hear the traffic outside. You might hear some shoppers walking up the street just adjacent to us. You see, there are different depths of our listening. And we can keep delving down. And it was amazing. I'd get people back after about 10 minutes, quarter of an hour. And they would begin to talk about the phases of listening. They would say, we heard these things in our immediate vicinity. It might be that tractor pulling a lawnmower along in the grass in the next field. But actually, when they listened beyond that, there were things they were hearing that they wouldn't have heard if they didn't intentionally listen. And there's an intention to listen in our hearts that's really important. In the spirit, there's a listening to the voice of God that requires us to create some space. I find that there are so many noises in the world that we live in today. And God's got a choice. He could speak louder than all of those noises and shout at you. And shout his will and his vision and his voice into your life. But I find that God doesn't do that. You may have had some moments in your life where he has shouted. So in our first service, God burdened one of the teams so strongly with something. And it was a real heart cry from the voice of God that interrupted our service because God wanted to shout something really clearly. That happens, but it's less frequent than the sort of whispers that God has. And it's not, it's not that he's distant. It's just he wants us to draw close to here. Because when you shout something, you can listen at a distance. When you whisper, you have to get close. And part of God's voice wants you to get close. So you've got to move your ear toward him. But to do that, you've got to clear out some of the noise. You've got to listen past the noise of your life. Tuning in in a noisy world. So finding that space and that rhythm. It might be that on your way to work, you've got to switch the radio off. It might be some point in your evenings, you have to switch your TV off. It might be that you have to, on your walk to work, stop listening to podcasts or stop listening to your favorite music for some part of that journey. It might be that there are activities that are filling your mind with all sorts of voices that may not be bad, but they're just so loud that you're not hearing the whispers of God's voice. And I'm not talking about sin, although that fits as well, except with sin, I'd say don't take a temporary break to give God some space, but take a permanent break from it. But the other stuff, that's not necessarily bad. But to create some space for the voice of God is important. But there's the noise that's exterior to this, but there's also the noise that's internal. Do you find this? I find this. I go to pray, and I suddenly remember all the things that I've gone about my day and forgotten suddenly all this to-do list comes to mind. Do you, does anyone else find that? Or is it just your very unspiritual pastor? I find it's a, great, it's a great aid to memory loss, prayer. All this stuff just comes back to mind. I used to get really frustrated with it and think, 
This is an attack of the enemy to stop me getting close to God. Well, certainly, if you don't move on from that moment, it can be a distraction and you can miss hearing the voice of God. But I find it's really helpful to get, have your phone, notepad or pen and just at those times, just to say, okay, I'm going to quickly jot those things down, get them out, get them on a to-do list and then I'm going to move on because God wants to speak as well. It's a good little tip because our minds can be noisy but there are other noisy bits in our mind that it might be some paradigms that we have set. So for example, if you think that your life is a mistake, then when God says you're precious, you're lovely, your noisy voice of I'm a mistake argues with the quiet voice of God, which says you're lovely and you are not a mistake. And a battle takes place. And at those times you have to contend to give space to allow the voice of God to win. And he does win because his truth wins. The Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But sometimes we don't experience the reality of that because we don't allow the voice of God to have the space to win the argument. And we, keep, and we dispel the voice of God, say there's no way God could love me like that. And then, and then we just allow the noisy voice of you're a mistake to be the winning voice. But a paradigm change it can be that your circumstance doesn't change. So a paradigm change is if you, somebody around you is doing something that really annoys you and they're a real problem, they're a real disturbance and you're just sitting there and you're thinking, I wish they'd stop, you know, they're just being disruptive on purpose and you, and you just have all these judgments that you're making about them and then you talk with them after the service and you find out that there's some physical condition that they're suffering with and it changes your view and your perspective. I remember a number of years ago, uh, leading a, a Christian youth camp, and there was a mother abroad, a teenage boy uh, there that suffered with some form of uh, mental health issues and um, some disabilities that meant that he would regularly in the service shout out things, just sounds. And he um, wasn't doing it maliciously, but I spoke to the mother. I said, I'd like you to... I'd like you and your son, if you wouldn't mind, to participate in something. Because you see, every time she took her son to a service, to any form of Christian church, her son couldn't help but shout these things out. And everybody would look around and just, where's that noise coming from? And it would be a distraction. And people would think, why didn't he be quiet? But I said, I'd like you to, to consider this. I'd like you for the first five minutes of the meeting to take your son outside. Just bring him in a bit late. And I'm going to explain to the young people this. Remember, there was about, probably, well, don't remember, you weren't there. Um, but let me tell you, there are about 400 young people in this room. And so I said, young people, there's a, there's a young guy here on this camp that's precious to God, that's loved by God, that was created by God. And he has some complications with his life that result in him often sounding noises that are unintelligible, but he can't help it. It's just part of his condition, but he's beautiful and uniquely made by God. And young people, this young man has spent much of his life feeling like he can't fit in. And I would like to set us a challenge this week, young people. The challenge is this. Can we give this young guy the best week of his life? Can we love on this young man? Can we embrace him? And rather than looking around and thinking, where's that sound coming from? I think, that's my brother that, that God loves. Do you know, those young people were amazing. They loved that. I think that guy had the best week of his life. I think those young people just embraced him. And you see, all that happened was they had some information that changed their paradigm understanding of the moment. And God wants to do that all the time about our circumstances. But to do so, we need to hear his voice. And he wants you to hear his voice. We need to create quiet in our lives to hear his whispers. What about our taste then? Well, we know Psalm 34 verse 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. There are all sorts of tastes that permeate in our, in our mouths. If you've had something bitter, it can hang around for a while. 
I don't know if any of you, you're probably all far too spiritual to watch. I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. But one of the favorite um, parts of that is when they have the eating challenges and they have to eat the most grotesque things that you could ever imagine anybody putting in their mouth. And there was one challenge the other day when they, a few hours later, came back to camp and said, I can still taste that cockroach milkshake in my mouth from hours ago. You know, there are things in our lives that we've tasted in our lives, we've tried, that leave a lasting influence and legacy on our lives. But I went to a wedding a number of years ago. It was a probably poshest wedding I've ever been to. And they, um, they kept serving so many courses. But I was a bit bemused why they kept serving desserts out between the courses. Because they kept bringing Zorbe. Now, I thought Zorbe was a dessert, but it wasn't. It was just a palate cleanser. It was meant to take away the taste of the previous dish so that your taste buds were clear for the next course that was coming. So I was counting these sort of palate cleansers as part of the course, and it was just getting ridiculous, you know, because I think it was a seven-course meal anyway, so it was like 14 courses. But a palate cleanser, you know, Jesus, Jesus comes to remove the bitterness from our mouths, from the unforgiveness, from the bitter words that have been in our mouths. And God tastes good. I love that. I love that the scripture even thought about this, to say, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, they reckon there's a connection between sight and taste. In fact, psychologists are now working on ways of changing the color of packaging and changing the, the, if they serve things on different color plates, it can taste different to people. There's a bit of a link that they're making there. I love that the scripture thought of that first. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And in our lives... We need to get rid of the bitter tastes in our lives and allow the Holy Spirit to be the one that we taste and consume. What about smell? Well, there's a story in John 12. It's, a, it's an amazing story. Imagine this scene. Someone's home. There's a guest of honor seat that Jesus has been given, rightly so, around the table of the 12 disciples. And there are a few other characters around this table. There's Mary, Martha. There's also Lazarus. Um, there's also um, a Pharisee, Simon the leper. And they're all around this table, just enjoying the evening together. I'm sure there's some profound truths that Jesus was sharing and talking about them with. And then a lady comes in, Mary, who has with her the most expensive bottle of perfume that she could muster up. Um, it was probably the equivalent of about a year's salary. So I don't know if anybody's planning on buying perfume for their wife this Christmas, but that would be a win if you managed to afford one of those. This was pretty expensive stuff. I don't know whether it had been some inheritance, but it was very valuable. And we probably suppose that this lady could have done with that money that she could have got from the sale of that. But instead of selling it, instead of putting it on eBay, instead of opening up shop, this lady, she walks into this meal and she kneels down at the feet of Jesus and she just pours this perfume all over his feet. And the aroma of that perfume just filled the air. Just imagine that scent just filling the room. Just imagine that some of the people around that table, there was Lazarus, who had at one point been in a tomb beginning to stink of death. And now he's around this table smelling of life. Imagine Simon the leper, who possibly was one of those that Jesus approached and touched and healed, that was smelling of decay and now smells of new start and new life. And now this room fills with this aroma of glorious beauty and worship. You know, Jesus has the ability to change the aroma of a situation. Jesus has the ability to turn the stench of death into the, into the aroma of life. But you have the ability to change the aroma of a room also. I often think that the lush store in the city 
is like the air freshener of the city. You know, you walk within a hundred mile radius of that and you can smell that shop. But our lives, we can be like the air fresheners of a city because our worship is a beautiful aroma to God. It's a beautiful expression of love and the presence of God. You know, often when we worship, we, we find that we see things differently. I find sometimes people say, you know, I'm going through a difficult time right now. I, I just really don't feel I can engage in worship without a level of hypocrisy in my life. That's the time to worship, guys. David said, I will not give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. And if it costs you a lot, the aroma is more beautiful. Let the aroma of Christ fill you. May the aroma of Christ flow over your lives. And then finally, touch. I love that that leper that was around that dinner table was someone that Jesus didn't just shout a command of healing from a distance. It was someone that he touched. I love that you and me, our lives have been touched by God. The gospel is not just a theoretical theology. It's not just a belief system. It's not just something that we engage to change our minds. But the gospel is a gospel that says God himself has come and touched our lives. And we can touch him daily. He's not a distant God. He says, come closer. And I find all too often people say, don't, I'm a bit stinky, God. Don't hug me. Times after, a, after you've been dancing, I am a friend of God. And that deodorant that you use that promises 48 hours <laughs> has never been tested in a worship context and doesn't work. And at the end of the service, someone goes to give you a hug. Say, don't, I'm a bit stinky. I find some people are like that with a God who wants to touch them. Oh, don't, God, I'm a bit stinky. God says, what are you on? Come on. And he loves us and gets close to us. But Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. And the Father hugs the mess and the stench of this world. And if we want to do what the Father wants us, we have to hug the stench and the mess of this world. I pray that our evangelism will not just be about dropping leaflets through anonymous people's doors and running before they come out and see who did it. I pray we will not just put signs up in areas that people will see the name of the church or put Facebook ads up that people that we don't know will see and maybe tune in and come along. I pray there will be a church that knows what it is to touch this community. To roll our sleeves up. I love what Mike and Sue do every week. Feeding the homeless in the city every week. That's worship. You know, those receiving it, it's feeding people's lives and then rumbling stomachs, giving them warmth. But to God, it's worship. And they're doing what the Father does, which is touch the lives of the broken. Cliff was on the front page of the Express and Echo this week. <laughs> Mentioned he'd been baptized in church recently. And he's involved in projects helping people who feel a bit stinky. And Jesus wants to touch them. And he wants his people to touch them. Let's not be a distant church. Let's be a people who know what it is to reach out, to extend our hands, even with the risk of getting our hands dirty, even with the risk of, I wonder if I'll catch their leprosy. You won't. Because the power of God is with you and he will help you change their lives. So, set your minds on things above, on the things the Spirit desires. Let your vision be his. May you hear his voice. May you taste his goodness.
May you smell the aroma of Christ and may you touch this world with the hope of the gospel.